as seen previously in part one of the number four. A mysterious handheld device called the Number 4 is passed from a homeless man to a security guard named Lance in 1960s London. Lance accidentally travels back to the Dark Ages, where he discovers that the Number 4 is a one-way ticket and lives the rest of his life as a blacksmith. The Number 4 is lost in the River Thames and turns up in the 1920s, when it is donated to a museum and purposefully used by a historian to travel back to the 1770s. Setting himself up as a merchant, this historian gives the device to a young sailor in the British Navy who clumsily drops it into the Atlantic Ocean, where it will wait for another two and a half centuries. The Number Four, Part Two. A pair of lights shone through the darkness, wandering around nearby and eventually training directly on the Number Four. An arm reached out, cold, mechanical, like the Number Four itself, and grasped onto the machine. The little red device was dragged up, up towards the surface, up towards the light it hadn't touched for centuries. Its dials spun freely as the pressure was released and the number four finally broke out of the water. What the hell is it? Padma called, frowning at the red shape clutched in the mechanical arm of their drone. Hold your horses, Jake grunted, yanking on the police chain. Their drone broke free of the water and a couple of the others guided it safely onto the deck. Its headlights went out and its mechanical arms lay still. Dibs! Rob called, as if he wasn't the leader of this mission, stepping up to the drone. He crouched down in front of it, carefully removing a clump of seaweed from the red object before taking the object itself out of the drone's claw. What is it? Padma asked again, crouching beside Rob. Jake and the others gathered behind them. I have no idea, Rob replied, turning the device over in his hands. You can never go back, he read. Number four. It looks old, Greg pointed out. Like, 1950s. Are you kidding? Jake shot back. If anything, it looks like it's from the future. Actually, someone else countered. It looks like something from the 1950s that's supposed to look like it's from the future. You mean like something from Star Trek? Rob suggested. Exactly. Padma stared at the device in her boss's hands. She could definitely see the similarities to all three theories. And yet, there was something totally alien, totally enigmatic about the device, as if it was not only from the future as well as the past, but it was also from somewhere else entirely. Some kind of alternate world, an alien planet, or a parallel universe. Rob stood up, the device still in his hands. I'm gonna go check this out, he announced. Looks like a storm, so we'll call it a day. Greg? Sup, Greg replied. Get Rob Jr. back into his case, and the rest of you... He waved his hand around, as if to suggest he didn't remember what it was they were supposed to be doing, but that they better get a move on. Do something. Dismissed. The four other men dispersed throughout the sea cucumber. Rob turned and stepped into the salon, taking the device with him. Padma stood there, on deck, feeling the chill of the upcoming storm through her layers of work clothes. Finally, she turned and went after Rob. She found the captain down below, in the small cabin they used for preliminary examinations of artifacts. Or the small cabin they would use in the unlikely scenario that they actually found something important. They had been going out on the sea cucumber for almost four months now, sending Rob Jr. down to the depths of the ocean in search of lost treasures from days long past. Rob had initially put together the team because one man, an amateur diver, who had allegedly discovered a pirate's cutlass on the ocean floor nearby. That had been last summer. Padma remembered the date well, August 2nd, 2029, and the crew of the Sea Cucumber still hadn't found anything. But Rob was wealthy and bored, so he kept paying them to come out here and look with him. Finally, four months later, it looked like their search had paid off. They had found something that looked vaguely important, though it certainly wasn't from the same era as the Cutlass. 1950s or the future? Padma asked, stepping down into the cabin. Rob, leaning over the single desk, cast a glance over his shoulder. Don't want to see what could be from the future, he replied. The future hasn't happened yet. She went to stand beside him, casting her eyes down at the mysterious device that lay on the desk. There was a strangely 1950s vibe to it, though she couldn't quite place where that came from. Maybe the rotating tiles or the red metal, maybe the rubbery dials and the big red button. The gear that jutted out of its left side was more industrial revolution in appearance, she thought, while the notes scratched into its hull seemed to be from all ages. Turn it over, she suggested. Rob obliged, and they were greeted with that somewhat disturbing note over the big black digit. What do you think number four means? She asked. 
I'm honestly more concerned with what you can't go back means, he replied. Padma reached down and turned the device onto its side, revealing a symbol scratched into the metal just below where the gear protruded. A swastika. Oh, nice, she muttered. Yeah, I saw that, Rob told her. But look, it's countered by... He took the device out of her hands and turned it over, revealing its underside. Another symbol was scratched into the red field, a Protestant fish. All right, she replied. So it was owned by both a Nazi and a Christian. You think we should make our own mark on it? He asked. Like in Paddle to the Sea? What? She replied. You mean like Rob was here? He shrugged, seeming to contemplate this idea for a moment before reaching across the desk and grabbing a pair of wire cutters which he dug unceremoniously into the front of the machine, to the right of the big red button. The sound of metal on metal was excruciating, but in five strokes he was done. A foreign symbol had joined the swastika, Jesus fish, and various English words that covered the red surfaces of the device. It wasn't a symbol that anyone particularly understood. Just one that had arisen recently in the graffiti subcultures and could be found scrawled on flat surfaces all across the first world. Well, that's not trendy, Padma said. Then, pointing to the words scratched above both glass plates. Look, days and years, it's a time machine. Rob looked up at her, and their eyes met. He was probably hoping for a dramatic moment, but she wasn't feeling it. What she had meant was that the device was probably supposed to look like a time machine. Or it was supposed to look like what a time machine would look like. So you think we press this big round button it'll shoot us back in time, yeah? He asked. Padma shrugged. Might as well, right? Well, I already did press the button, he told her, fiddling with the dials. Couple of times. Didn't do shit. Rob! She cried, unable to keep the surprise out of her voice. What? What? He met her eyes again, and she gestured down towards the machine. He turned to look as the glow became brighter, illuminating the green glass and filtering out into the cabin. Determined, he continued to twist the dials. The top Rolodex numbers flew past 999 and returned to 000 as the bottom ones edged up on 500. Padma couldn't say whether the digits were meant to be read separately or as whole numbers, but the shoddily written labels, days and years, suggested the latter. The green light continued to grow exponentially until it had been bathed the entire cabin in its tint. A glance behind them told Padma that the others had come to the door of the salon and were looking down with interest. Try the button now, she suggested. Whatever the machine was, it seemed to have woken up from its slumber. The top line of digits read 091, the bottom 0479. Without hesitation, Rob pressed his thumb down on the fat red button. For a tense moment, it seemed that nothing happened. Then the light grew brighter, Rob's face contorted in surprise and he was gone. For a brief instant, Rob saw a blue sky and wondered what infinite possibilities there were for him now that he was a time traveler. Then he fell into the North Atlantic Ocean and his nervous system shut down. His last thought before his lungs filled with seawater was, damn you, number four. Thanks to a storm that whipped up out of nowhere, Rob's body washed ashore only a couple weeks later. He was picked apart by gulls who also tried to steal the bright red device out of his coat. But, finding it too heavy, the gulls abandoned what they believed could be a new kind of shellfish and flew away. Months later, scavengers from the north came across what they soon discovered were human remains, wearing torn-up clothes of a material never before seen in Ireland. The body had been washed ashore and pulled back out by the tide more times than the scavengers liked to consider. But it wasn't the body they were interested in. It was the bizarre metal device that lay on the rocks nearby. The number four made its way across Ireland, changing hands in exchange for money or goods of equal curiosity. No one even came close to understanding its purpose, but they all thought it was quite intriguing. Eventually, the number four was traded to an English merchant in exchange for a couple of fish and a swig of liquor. This merchant took the device to London, where he sold it to a young man who seemed mighty interested in it. The young man was an apprentice named Richard. His master called him Tricky Dick. He didn't know what Tricky Dick meant, but he liked the way it sounded. On that day, Richard spent twice his monthly allowance to buy the number four. His purchase of a new musical instrument would be delayed again, and he would have to forego that month's appointment with his favorite Lady of the Night, but it would all be worth the price to see his master's face. 
Master? Richard called, stepping into the foundry and closing the door behind him. They hadn't been open for business very often, not since the old man had grown sick. He held the red object behind his back and couldn't keep the grin from his face. Master, are you in here? There was a horrible retching sound from the back of the building, from the old man's bedroom where Richard wasn't allowed to go. I'm back here, tricky dick, his master called in a hoarse voice. Richard stepped up to the curtained doorway separating his master's room from the rest of the foundry. Here is something I would like to give you, he said, his face held close to the curtain. Come inside, his master called. A thrill ran through Richard. He had never been allowed inside the master's bedroom before. This was new, he thought, new and exciting. But, he reminded himself, not nearly as exciting as the idea of showing his master the red object, whatever it was. With hands trembling in excitement and suspense, Richard pushed open the curtain and stepped inside. The master's bedroom was small, smaller than he had imagined it, with a straw bed in one corner. There were no windows. The only light came from the candles spread around the foundry or the wide door on days they were open for business. Richard was almost disappointed at how simple his master's enigmatic room really was, until he saw the etchings on the walls, and his curiosity returned in a flash. All across the three plastered walls of the room were pictures drawn in charcoal or lead, designs that Richard couldn't even hope to understand. One looked like a great bird with a thin body and powerful wings. Another drawing looked sort of like a house, but very tall and thin. More buildings were scattered around it, some of them tall and some of them small. A block of words was transcribed on the wall. Richard couldn't read, and he was surprised to discover that his master could write. But the most shocking image was the one just above the master's bed, taking him nearly the entire wall. It was a perfect illustration of the red object that Richard held behind his back. What is it? The master asked. Richard looked over, almost surprised to see him there. He was so wrapped up in the etchings that he had almost forgotten why he came. He stepped over to the bed. The master looked older and weaker than ever, even more so than he had the day before. His beard had been growing out for several months as the hair fell out of his head. He now resembled how Richard had always pictured God himself. I have something for you, Richard said. The master blinked his watery eyes open and struggled to keep them there. With a thrill of excitement, Richard took the red object out from behind his back and held it out in front of him. Without an instant of hesitation, the master's eyes flew open wide and he leapt back, scooting into a seated position against the wall, holding out an aged finger as if he was being confronted by death himself. It is just like the one you described, Richard said, confused at his master's fear. Remember when you paid those men to look for it? I found it for you, see? Get rid of it, the master hissed. Get rid of it! After the number four had disappeared, literally vanished, from his foundry seven months earlier, Lance hadn't thought he would ever see it again. But now it was here, before his eyes, and he felt the sight of it pushing on his aged heart like a hammer. I'm sorry, Richard said, surprised and hurt. I thought you wanted to find it again, but if you don't, I will- Wait, Lance said, forcing himself to calm down. He was only 52. In the 20th century, he would have downed some meds and been alright. But now, in the middle of the 16th century, he could feel the life slipping out of his body. He didn't know exactly what disease he had contracted, but he knew it was fatal. The number four, he had realized half a year earlier, was an unfaithful mistress. He had dutifully waited eight years for its power to return and send him back to the 1960s. But in December of 1550, the entire machine had disappeared. It hadn't just been lost or stolen. Lance had taken the number four out of its protective chest and was actively fiddling with it when it seemed to fade away, splitting into a million particles, like sand in the wind. And now, it was back. Seven months later, it was back. Slowly, trying not to overexcite himself, Lance took a hold of the machine that had stolen his life. It was heavy, heavier than he remembered it being. Or perhaps he had just grown weaker. The swastika was still there, just below where the gear protruded from the metal. Someone had added another symbol, one he didn't recognize, beside the red button. Above the glass windows, someone else had added the words days and years. Lord God, he thought. I wish those had been there when I used it. Turning the machine over, he saw another few words. A message that, if he had seen it in that alleyway all those years in the future, would probably have saved his life. You can't go back, 
It read, in thin letters etched just above the big, black, number four. Bury it, Lance said. What? Richard asked, his breath caught in his throat. I may not be long for this world, Lance told him. But before I move on, I want you to bury this infernal device as far beneath the shop as you can. I want you to move everything in the shop and pry up the floorboards. And then I want you to start digging. Dig until you can't dig anymore. And then I want you to drop this machine into the hole and fill the hole back up. You cannot ever tell anyone that it's down there. Richard nodded, barely understanding. He didn't know what a machine was, but he assumed it was some sort of curse word. Do you swear, Richard? The master cried, grasping the boy's hand in his. Do you swear that no one will ever know about this? I swear. Richard squeaked, suddenly afraid. Had his master gone completely mad? Insane or not, the master was insistent, and Richard completed his task as he had promised, digging a hole deeper than he was tall in the center of the foundry. After one final look at the mysterious object, Richard tossed it into the pit and began covering it in dirt. In the year 1553, Lance the blacksmith died. The number four remained buried beneath his foundry, even as all his possessions were sold or stolen. For centuries, no one knew of any small red device from another time period. Queen Elizabeth was quite contented with the scepter she had, and her musicians were quite alright with not stealing from the crown, thank you very much. In the 18th century, a man named Max stepped into existence. As he did, the small red device he held in his hands dissipated into thin air, off to rejoin its current self buried beneath London. 400 years after Lance's death, and about 40 years after his birth, a London museum curator was arrested for stealing from his place of work. When asked if he had sold any of his stolen artifacts, he replied that he had traded a vintage pistol to a bartender in exchange for a bottle of whiskey. The bartender had presented the pistol to his friend Max, who had done the right thing and returned it to the museum, going on to live a decent life and dying in the year 1989 almost 200 years after he had died. In the year 1960, a man named Bill Trombley appeared in Boston, Massachusetts, having traveled from the year 2017. Inspired by his second favorite science fiction series, Trombley believed he could prevent the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, thus rewriting the latter half of the 20th century for the better. However, extraneous circumstances prevented him from doing so, and JFK was killed on 11 63 just as history intended. Trombley, however, went on to make a name for himself by moving to London and preemptively pitching his first favorite science fiction series to BBC One, which debuted the day after Kennedy's assassination and featured a wizard-like alien named The Doctor, who traveled time and space in a red phone box. A month after the debut of his television program, Bill Trombley passed a man named Lance on the street. The two didn't even glance at each other. Fourteen years later, when a 50s-era movie theater was demolished on the outskirts of London, an excavator would uncover an iron hook along with several other metal artifacts, which were positively identified as being more than 400 years old, to the great chagrin of the builders. Construction of the Red Mart grocery store was delayed, and a team of archaeologists commandeered the site. The man who found the number four as he worked, the Earth's surface higher than his scalp and his back baking in the sun, immediately dismissed the machine as some modern contraption. Some modern toy, presumably, as it did maintain a vaguely etch-a-sketch or rock'em sock'em robots aesthetic. And it was only saved by another digger, Brenna, who saw the number four and examined it herself. It was on that archaeological dig, underneath a hastily constructed tent on the outskirts of London, that a familiar scene played out. One that had been reenacted many times throughout history, throughout the future, in timelines that no longer existed. When Brenna activated the number four, its top slideshow digits read 154, and its bottom ones, 0056. 
When Brenna vanished from her time, her fellow archaeologists, and a few interested pedestrians, could only stare in surprise. But their confusion was nothing compared to the jaw-dropping shock of seeing a half-naked woman appear in the street, narrowly missing death by Model T Ford. On the 17th of July, 1977, and, subsequently, on the 13th of February, 1921, Brenna wore jean shorts, boots, and a button-down shirt rolled up to expose her midriff. In her own time, she looked like just another archaeologist trying to dig up some old metalwork before the Redmark Corporation pushed them out. But nearly 50 years before the advent of modern feminism, she stood out like a sore thumb on a hoofed animal. Ah, Ooga! cried the mechanical beast in front of her, slowing to a stop. She turned around as the world spun, faces stared down at her, eyes wide and mouths gaping. People shouted, their voices came at her from all directions, unintelligible sounds from the entire emotional spectrum. All she could latch onto in the physical world was the device in her hands which she clutched to her chest, savoring the realness of the cool metal. Can Brenna the archaeologist survive a near-death experience in the middle of a busy street? How will she adjust to life in the Roaring Twenties? And who will be the next innocent bystander to have their future stolen away by the chaotic neutral enigma known as the Number Four? Find out next time in The Number Four, Part Three. Also, like and subscribe and buy my book. Mm -hmm.